Today's video was recorded on October 4th, 2022. And in today's lesson, we explore a concept within spirituality known as awakening from above and awakening from below. Understanding this concept helps us recognize the importance of being doers of the word rather than just hearers of the word, as James mentions in James 1, verse 22. So it's through the process of doing that we gain a deeper insight into the wisdom behind God's commandments, and we experience a transformation that brings us closer to God. So in this way, when we make the commandments our own by doing them, we unleash the transformative power that lies in the Word of God. So instead of just an intellectual knowing of the commandments, we move into a deeper type of participatory knowing. And it's when we participate by doing the commandments that we gain that insight. This is what the book of Exodus shows us. Now for today's lesson, I'm providing a diagram of a literary structure that exists in the final 15 chapters of Exodus. So you'll want to download that class handout so you can see the diagram as I'm explaining it. It's very important that we see the structure that the author has put into the book itself because the structure itself points to what we should be focusing on. And just as a reminder, each week we provide a handout for the lessons. So make sure you go down to the description section below this video or the podcast, and you'll see a link there for the PDF that is the class handout. These lesson handouts are there to help facilitate your learning. Because the study of the Bible itself is an excellent example of what we're going to be talking about today as an awakening from below. The more we learn the Bible, the greater ability the words of God have to transform us at the deepest level. So we hope you enjoy this lesson on the concept of an awakening from above, an awakening from below. Okay, we're going to do the next couple of weeks is going to be around this topic about awakening from above and below, and we'll really flesh it out. So tonight is a bit of an introduction, but I really think you're going to like it. It's a the final 15 chapters, at least, of Exodus are built in a literary structure. We'll talk more about that next week or the week after, but it's very intentional. The actual structure of the text is sending us the message, and it's important to see that structure. Once you see it, it's almost like you can't unsee it. You know it's there, and it has to do with this. Well, a lot of it has to do with this concept about awakening from above or awakening from below. So this is going to be our 23rd study in Exodus. And let's see, the picture here, um, this is a lithograph that was printed in 1907. Now, what I had to do, just so you know, to build the PowerPoint, I had to zoom in. So I wanted to get the cloud on Mount Sinai, God coming down, and the people there. But if you zoom out, there you can see the whole painting. So I just zoomed it in because I needed something for the background. But as God comes down, revel a revelation or awakening from above, and the people come to God, uh, the awakening or revelation from below. So hopefully we've that picture helps encapsulate the idea. So this theme, awakening from above, awakening from below, it runs throughout the book of Exodus, although it's much more prominent at the end. Well, particularly after the Red Sea, but towards the end of the book. And that's where we're going to spend our time today. And it has to do with redemption. And as I mentioned last week, redemption in Exodus, and I believe when we talk about the fullness of redemption, is a two step process, at least. And I think, God willing, by the time we're done tonight, you'll see that as well. You'll see what I mean. And then over the next couple of weeks, we'll be looking even closer at how this is working out and what this idea of redemption is. Because even within our, the full, fullness of the Christian church, from, from Western Protestantism to Eastern Orthodox, we often have slightly different ideas of what redemption or salvation is. So, uh, I mentioned this last week, 
that redemption is a two-step process. So let's walk through that a minute. And I'll show you some pictures. This is number one, by the way, on your handout. Um, we started with this slide last week saying, hey, look, the book of Exodus itself is a, is a, there's a flow to it, a progress from slavery in the beginning to the entirety of, of the idea of redemption is the presence of God dwelling in the place of God with the people of God. And that's how the book of Exodus ends. And then we had noted that that's how the Bible is structured from the Garden of Eden, where God's presence is with his people, all the way out to the last chapters of Revelation, where it's a new Jerusalem, and God will be their God, and he will be their people, and God will dwell with his people. That's the point of the Bible. So how do we get God to dwell here on earth, right? When Jesus says, your kingdom come, your will be done, it's on earth as it is in heaven. So we need to Part of the goal here in our Christian walk and in our churches is to manifest the kingdom of God here on earth as best we can, even in our flawed condition. One day, we'll be fully redeemed. So there's multi-step process to this redemption. Okay, now we noted something. Uh, we should note something. This is what I'm going to do tonight. I will note this. God, they, they begin in slavery. God's going to bring them out of slavery, but that's just the beginning of the journey or the beginning of the process. And there's an intermediate step, at least one of them we'll look at tonight, and that is Mount Sinai. So God brings them to Mount Sinai, and then once he gets them there, now God and the people are going to meet, and God's going to propose a covenant to them. The people must accept the covenant, just like a, a, a marriage covenant. The people must accept. God doesn't force that upon them. And then even after they've seen everything that God has done and they've said yes to the covenant, what happens? Do they fully obey the commands? And the answer is no. So they've gone through all of this and seen God, right? They've, they've, uh, They've seen God deliver them from Pharaoh. They've seen God bring them through the Red Sea. He meets them on the mountain, right? And all of that doesn't magically change the people. So even though there's redemption out of Egypt, it's not fully complete yet. Because the people aren't necessarily magically tr transformed, right? So what happens? What do the people end up doing? The golden calf. And this is going to be the center point of the structure in the last part of Exodus is that golden calf event. That's the turning point. So they're, they create the golden calf, and ultimately what's going to happen after this is that the Israelites are going to have to come together and act. And it's a transformational process so that by the time they're done with the transformational process, they've created the space for God. And that's where God comes down into his tabernacle. Now, initially, it's, a, it's an actual physical space, the tabernacle. Later, we're going to abstract that metaphor, right? We're going to abstract that out. And we can say in our own lives, in our own communities, that we can create a space for God, that we can create a space in time, a space of, of a physical locality, a spiritual space for God. And then it's in that acting that the transformation happens. It's when they start participating with God, and we'll look more at this next week, how they structure inside the text. They're participating with God. They become uh, what we could say. They're not just hearers of the word, seeing God be revealed, but they're doers of the word. And one thing we'll see tonight, there are some commandments that can truly only be understood when we do them, not just think about them. It's we get the understanding when we're actually 
implementing the commandment itself. We, we get insight from God through the implementation. And that's really important because it takes us to do that. We have to partner with God. So what we see here in the text is we have a movement, right? The first movement is God's going to, he does, and when, let me say it this way, God does all the delivering. He goes to battle with Pharaoh. He tells them, I don't want you to fight. I'll do it all on your behalf. He splits the Red Sea. And so he shows up on Mount Sinai. And so what you see is it's God doing it, right? And so that would be your uh, awakening from above. God's being revealed from above. But unfortunately, it ends in the golden calf. And then you have a second movement, and that second movement is to create that space for God. And the second movement, then, it's the individual and the community that has to participate. And when we participate, we have insight. We gain a deeper revelation of the importance of, say, God's commandments or what, God, what the kingdom of God is up to. And that's when we transform even more. And this is the awakening from below. And so when I say below, it's because our insight or um, the impact that God is happening is because it's emerging out of us and the experience we're having rather than just being dictated from top down. So many people view the Bible as God just dictating from top down. That's not what happens. Yes, God is revealed from above, but in order to get full redemption, at least in the book of Exodus here, it takes participation from the community. Okay, this is the flow of Exodus, from above, from below. And now what I'm going to do, still number one on your handout, is we're going to look then at this list. I created a list of just characteristics of each aspect of this. So um, first, we'll start with awakening from above. This is when and I think this still happens today. When someone comes to Christ, God breaks through the bounds of, I put nature, but it's really apparent nature because it's, God can break through all of that. We have the hard time envisioning God breaking through that. But God breaks through the bounds of nature. It's the 10 plague. It's the Red Sea, right? Water normally doesn't divide like that. It's a pillar of smoke and a pillar of fire to lead you through the wilderness. It's fire on Mount Sinai coming down. There's even a point in the book of Exodus. It's, in, uh, chap it's at the end of chapter 20. Um, the Bible says literally that the Israelites saw the voice of God. And the word there, most of your Bibles, your, your Bibles might say they saw the thunder, which is still a little strange. But the word for thunder is the same word for voice. So they saw the voice of God, however that worked. Okay, so that's how God breaks through in some way, shape, or form. We have a revealing of God's nature or a revealing of God's will. Or for many people nowadays, if you're an atheist, I mean, back then in Exodus, nobody was an atheist. They just had tons of gods. This is now the revealing of one true God. But today, you know, when, when an atheist has this revelation of God, it's like something is breaking through from above. And there's many people have this experience of completely other that just showed up, and it's this realization that God exists. But it's all coming from above. So what happens, there's, and we see this in Exodus as well, there's a sense of awe. Awe is a mix of emotions. It's fear and wonder at the same time. You're standing in front of something that's so huge or transcendent, you just can't take it all in. And so it could be an awakening, uh, an awakening to the way that we see the world, like the, the great song, I was blind, but now I see. It's that awakening. It's a revelation. And then... This is the part that's really interesting, and it's the final point about the awakening from above, is there's a limitation to the power to fully transform humanity, which sounds like, wait a minute, are you saying that God has a limitation? Well, it seems as though 
The moment you say yes to Jesus, right, you enter the new covenant, you're in a covenant relationship with God, God doesn't magically transform you into a perfect human being. You still have a long way to go. So there's actually a limitation to the power of transformation. He gives us free will, so we have to then participate. There were no limitations. Once the Israelites said yes, boom, they'd be magically into this perfect people group, and they're not. And it's the same way for our Christian walk, which is why it's a journey. It's a walk towards the sanctification process, um, spiritual growth process. So, and I think, you know, there's no doubt that you can have these tremendous changes. I mean, some of the stories of people coming to know Christ are amazing, but they still have a journey ahead of them. So that's part of the point. Okay, what has to happen next? Well, it's the awakening from below. And this is the transformation that it's when we can understand God or we can understand something about God, the, the reality of, of God's creation, the kingdom of God, that we understand through the participation of the covenant relationship. Transformation comes through the actions that we take. And I think if you think about this in your own walk, it's, it's like being an observer of church where you just show up every Sunday and you just kind of observe what's happening, or you're participating in the life of the church and you're serving and you're giving your time and you're giving your talents and you're giving, uh, tithing is a big one, right? That's a transformative event when you, when you actually walk through the action of giving. And this is what, this is so cool because I think so many things about the commandments, we learn through doing them, right? It's not enough to know that you shouldn't lie. You learn the, the impact of not lying by actually not lying, right? By being truth-telling. The transformational power is in the action of doing truth-telling. So we have to practice truth-telling. And now, gracious truth-telling. You don't want to run around and point out every true thing about somebody. That's rude. You want to be gracious. But truth-telling is that you live in an integrated life. You have integrity. That's an internal process, and it makes us stronger. There's a transformational process. And we understand the importance of telling the truth by doing it. We participate in the divine plan. And for our New Testament language, it's the kingdom of God. The whole book of Acts is building that kingdom of God. It's a participatory event. So you, you, you engage, um, you know, maybe somebody who became a Christian and then was kind of an, an observer at first and then started getting involved. You know, we want to move people from the pews to being participants as volunteers. And that usually when they do that, there's, it's a transforming event. They begin to see the church differently than they did if they're just observing. So we're building the kingdom of God. Uh, let's see. Oh, so the awakening from below, what we do is we learn about God through insight, through self-reflection. It's when we can see the actions and how they matter around us, right? Again, we build the kingdom just like Jesus says, teaches us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. And faith, so much of faith, is not just a belief in a proposition. Do I have faith that by telling the truth, the highest possible outcome will happen? Because so many people refrain from telling the truth because they're afraid of the outcome, when truth, by definition, leads to the highest possible outcome. So faith is walking with God, having faith that when I forgive my enemy, that's the highest possible outcome, and then watching it unfold, and then it building up my faith to see what happens when we actually go through. So it's, it's an action. Uh, when Jesus says, forgive your enemy, it's not just nice words, right? He, he wants us to actually do it, and it's when we do it, when we choose to forgive, that's when we gain insight into the power of forgiveness. 
It's a deeper form of knowing. It, you could call it participatory knowing. You know it because you're participating in it rather than intellectual knowing. And what happens, and we'll see this, it, that, that shows in the book of Exodus. Now notice in the book of Exodus, then none of this is explained. It's in the narrative itself. And that's one of the hardest things about reading the Old Testament. The truth is inside the narrative, and then you have to pull it out of the narrative. But the awakening from below is really what solidifies the transformation. And then I think I'll show you an example of that next week with Moses about the solidifying of the transformation. But okay, this is a huge message inside of the book of Exodus. And then what I want to at least do, just to give you two verses, is this is what the New Testament says as well. Okay, so I just want to do, just take a moment and reflect on the New Testament, because what we're going to find is the same exact thing. It's kind of like faith without works is dead, and it's not works like salvation works. It's faith without action that follows up the faith. It's the reason we go out in a, in a church and do things, because it's the doing that is, that, you know, it really is transformative for us. So, uh, if you have your Bible, you can open up to Matthew. This is just one. I mean, there's many, but I wanted to give two quick examples. Matthew 7, 24. Just to point out something about Matthew here. So, Jesus says here, he says, Everyone, therefore, who hears these words of mine and does them will be compared to a wise man who built his house on a rock. Now, I think you, could, you guys know the rest. Those who don't do it, well, that's your build your house on sand. And you guys understand the whole, that you're, you're building an unstable foundation is the whole point. But look, this is really important. He who hears these words, now, is it only that I hear them? No, there's this little word, and, right here, everyone, therefore, who hears these words and does them. Well, what if I hear them and I don't do them? Well, now you're not putting, you're not putting the revelation of God into action here on earth. And it's our action that manifests goodness and the kingdom here on earth. What good is it if Jesus says, feed the poor, if we never go out the door and feed the poor? That's where the transformation comes, not only for us, but for the community around us. So it's very important to recognize it's not just about hearing, but doing. Okay. Um, another one, real quick, I'll do this one. Uh, James 1, and I'm just going to put up verse, I think, 25. No, 22. Verse 22. James 1, 22. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Be doers of the word. We take the word and we put it into action. That's the transformational process. And that's what Exodus is showing us. And then what you get is this idea, generally only found within Judaism, because Christians tend to take all of our concepts from the New Testament. But uh, you find the same thing. The New Testament writers, being Jewish, are, are pulling right from Exodus, but they just put it in different context or different language. Okay, so awakening from above, awakening from below. It's doing the word, okay? Now, what I want to show you, there's so many little details, and this is just broad introduction to this, is if you turn your sheet over to page two, and we're going to look at, um, I'm just going to create a diagram. We'll review this again next week. It's a diagram of Exodus chapters 25 to 40. That's the last 15 chapters of Exodus. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a gigantic structure built into the literary, it's a literary device. It's called a chiasm. Now I'm going to deal with this later, but it's called a chiasm. It's based off of the Greek letter chi, which is an X. And I'll do that. I'll talk more about that structure next week. But suffice to say, you will see it in a minute as it 
kind of shows up. And what, we're, what it's going to do is visually give you the idea of awakening from above, awakening from below. So, Exodus 25 to 40, we find instructions for building the tabernacle. And we find it twice. That's, of course, what makes it painful to read, because you're like, why am I reading this stuff again? I just went through this. Is this God already giving me a test? Uh, you've got the diagram, but let me build it out and explain what's going on. So we start right at the end of chapter 24, going, leading into chapter 25. You have God's presence on Mount Sinai. The dark cloud, the fire, the smoke, and Moses enters into that presence to meet with God. That's what the text tells us. What we get, what comes out of that, are the tabernacle instructions. And what's important to note is these first set of tabernacle instructions are all from God. So what you find, and we'll look at this next week, the Lord said to Moses, the Lord said to Moses, the Lord said to Moses, the Lord said to Moses. Moses. It's all the Lord speaking. Then you get to the end of the tabernacle instructions. God gives instructions for the Sabbath. So again, the Lord is speaking. And now, unfortunately, what happens after that is we end up, and this is the kind of the, the turning point to our chiastic structure, is you end up with the golden calf incident. So the chiastic structure looks something like this. If you put an X on the screen, or if you put half an X. So the lines, be, the, the verses begin to match up. The verses from above of, end up matching the verses in below. So the, you get to the cold and t calf incident. There's a flipping, and now what happens? God leaves the picture. You no longer hear the Lord's read. What you hear is Moses. Now Moses gives Sabbath instruction. Then comes the tabernacle instructions, and it's all Moses. And Moses said this, and Moses said that, and now you get the community participating. And the community is building it, and the community is doing this, and the community is donating the, um, the materials. And so you can see it's a complete inversion. And what happens at the very end, once they build the tabernacle and Moses blesses it, just like Genesis, the presence of God dwells, and the presence of God dwells so strongly in that tabernacle that Moses can't enter it. And so you can see, just from this picture, it's like you have on one side, the upper side, it's all God. He's giving all the instructions. He's doing all the work. That's the awakening from above. But they end up, it, it results in the golden calf. And now God wants to go, you know, after the golden calf, God wants to destroy his people. Moses talks him out of it. And the next thing you know, Moses goes down, transformed in a way, transfigured. He's got the glowing face. And now Moses starts to lead the Israelites. Moses gives the instructions. Moses, the, the Israelites do the work. That's the awakening from below. It's their, participata yeah, their participation that brings on the transformation. At least this is how we can, we can understand what's happening here. So we get, we get that line that goes all the way down. It points at the golden calf. It inverts. This is what a chiastic structure looks like. And now you get the presence of God. So if you think about this concept enough, so much of life the knowing is participatory, right? All day long, you could, you know, it's like a 10,000 hours of doing a job. You could read as many textbooks as you want, but until you start participating and doing it where you actually, uh, you know, that's the transforming, the transformational power. And the same thing with God. God wants us to participate. Through that participation, we transform especially something like tithing, you know, where people intellectually try to solve tithing. It's like, no, just do it. And then after you do it, then you begin to understand deeper what's going on. And 
So it's like we knew, we understand it by doing rather than by an intellectual exercise. Okay. Now, last thing, this is what I want to finish up with, is I want to look at one verse then, because this verse is going to help, well, this concept is going to help us understand the verse. The verse is going to help us understand the concept. So if you have your Bible, turn to Exodus 24, 7. Okay, so Exodus 24, 7, God has given them all of the, the book of the covenant. That's what we did last week, the commandments. Then Moses brings a sacrifice, and then he says to the people, okay, well, are we going to accept this covenant or not? And so here's what verse 7 says. Verse 7, he took the book of the covenant and he read it in the hearing of the people. And the people said, all the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will hear. Now, your Bible probably says, we will obey. Same Hebrew word. But lo notice the order. We will do, we will hear. Now, this is on your handout, but it's something to note about um, the Hebrew word shema means to hear. So they literally say, we will hear, even though it gets translated obey. Shema, it's the first word in, that, in the greatest commandment that Jesus says is that what's the greatest commandment? Shema Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. That's the first word. So even today, your Jewish friends and neighbors call it the Shema. And Shema just means hear. So um, it's an interesting note. And it's kind of a strange thing, but interesting to note. It's instructive. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs points this out all the time, that Hebrew, Judaism and the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, is a, there's 613 commandments in the Torah, Genesis through Deuteronomy. And Judaism is a religion about doing, about obeying. But there's actually no singular word for obey. So you have all these commandments, and you have a religion about obedience, but no actual word for obey. The word is here, Shema. And so there seems to be a, a deep connection between hearing God and obeying God. And so if we can work on hearing God, then you obey God. If you hear God, should you obey? Yes. And part of our, us understanding the revelation of God is the Bible itself, because we've got it written down and we can reflect upon it and, and understand God's will. So part of the hearing and obeying is understanding. So how do we understand some of these commandments? Well, like they said, like it says here, do them first, and then you will hear or you will understand. Okay, so one of the main questions, this is a very famous verse, uh, Exodus 24-7, within Judaism, because the rabbis puzzle over this exact question. Why does it say we will do and we will hear? Shouldn't it be the other way around? Shouldn't we say we will hear what you have to say, God, and then we will do it, put it into action? But it doesn't. And so they puzzle on this, and they puzzle and they puzzle, and there's all stories told about it. But I want to share one particular story because it helps illustrate this idea of doing commandments and the power in actually doing a commandment. So there is a concept within Judaism that I think we've talked about before. It's called Midrash. And Midrash is like a parable. Jesus tells a parable, which is a story to help you understand a commandment or something in the Bible. The story illustrates, the story draws you in. The story gets you involved and it helps you go deeper into a particular commandment. So there's a very famous story, and I'm going to paraphrase it, but I, have, I gave it to you on the handout, page three of the handout. And I'm pulling from a, um, a writing, it's called Pirke de Rabbi Eleazar, which is a consolidation of all of these stories. And it has to do with this commandment right here, Exodus 24, 7. So God, here's, the, let me just, and again, I'm going to paraphrase, but you'll get the point. God wants to 
Go to a nation and say, do you want my Torah? Do you want my law? Do you want my instruction manual? Do you want my commandments? And all the, everyone's saying no to God. This is how the story goes, okay? So um, God start, starts out. This is how it's told in uh, this particular one. God starts out, and he goes to the Edomites. Those are the descendants of Esau. And he says, would you yourselves, would you like my Torah? And they said, well, what's in it? Tell us what's written in it. And he says to them, you shall not murder. And they go, oh, no, we're not able to do that. And then they quote some, some text because they're going to proof text it. And the Edomites say, no, 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 we can't take your Torah based on what it says. So God says, okay. And he goes to the next people group. He goes to the descendants of Ishmael. And he says, he says to them, will you accept my Torah? And their question to him is exactly what we would think. Well, what's it say? What are we going to have to do? And he says, you shall not steal. And you can see he's, they're pulling from the Ten Commandments here. Um, and the, 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 the descendants of Ishmael said, no, 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 we can't, we can't do that. We're not going to be able to, we can't accept that Torah. And they quote something from Genesis. And then God, you know, he's getting, he's getting uh, frustrated. So he goes to all the nations of the world. And he sends messengers and he says to them, will you receive my Torah? And their first question, well, what's in it? What's it say? And this answer is, you shall have no other gods before me. They're like, well, we can't do that. So you can see the whole story is being told about how God wants everyone else to have their Torah. Then he goes to Israel. He gets to Israel and it says, while the Torah had not yet been heard. They said to him, we will keep and observe your precepts, precepts which are in the Torah, as it is said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do, and there's the we will do, and we will obey. We will hear. And so it's this great little story of trying to puzzle out what's going on in this, in this, uh, Exodus 24, 7, because it should say, first we'll hear and then we'll do. Now, what does that mean, right? What's the point? What do we get out of that? That you got this whole story. How do you interpret what's going on here? And I think one of the best interpretations that I've read, it comes from a, a gentleman named uh, uh, Lawrence Kushner, Rabbi Kushner. He's got some amazing books. And this book happens to be Jewish Spirituality, A Brief Introduction for Christians. So it's a great book on Jewish spirituality. In this book, he talks about this commandment, 20, Exodus 24-7. And here's what he says, and I put this on your sheet so you can have it. He says, look, the power of doing and then hearing, and he says, some actions simply cannot be understood until they are performed. So we can't fully understand a commandment of God unless you do it. Tithing and Sabbath. You know, why, why does God tell us to take a day off of work or day off a week? Isn't that a good idea? You know, don't most people say you got to cut things out of your life rather than add stuff into your life? Wouldn't a Sabbath be a pretty good idea for humanity instead of working ourselves to death? So, but when you do Sabbath, with God, you create that space for God, and now you get a deep sense of the power and the wisdom behind that commandment, right? So some actions simply cannot be understood until they, they are performed. And then he says this, by doing, we understand. And I think that's the, that's the revelation from below, is when you begin to participate in the building of the kingdom. You begin to understand on a deeper level the importance of God's commandments and why doing them is so important. And then I put I, I added this sentence in there. He says, in this way, performing a mitzvah, which is a commandment, changes us and brings us closer to God. And that's what we're talking about. There's a transformation happening to the Israelites through the participation. Notice it's not about salvation. 
It's not about the salvation. They're not doing it so they can be saved. God has delivered them, but they're doing it for the redemption, for the fullness of redemption, for God's presence to dwell with them. And what happens? What's the whole point? It brings them closer to God. God's presence now dwells inside their community very powerfully. And I would argue the same thing happens to us, and either in our own lives or our communities, when we begin to take seriously things like forgive your enemy or forgive, you know, forgiveness is hard. And we can say, yeah, 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 I know Jesus wants me to forgive, but then we don't do it. And it's the doing, it's through the practice of forgiveness that you begin to have the insight over the transformational power of something like forgiveness. And if we can't do that, and we're giving up something. And I think, while the world needs forgiveness nowadays, we have baseless hatred abounds. Hatred for no reason. And the only way, the only antidote to that is to start choosing forgiveness. But it's through the choosing of forgiveness that we transform. So it brings us closer to God. Okay, so hopefully I think think, well, let me do a quick review. It's all about this model right here. It's all about that. Because what we don't notice when we read Exodus, say you read Exodus because you're trying to read your Bible through the year, you don't stop and pay attention to the, to the nuances of the text. But if you can see that there's actually a structure, right? So we have an awakening from above where God is doing all the work, but it doesn't transform them, right? You can see the Lord said here, and God gave Sabbath instructions here. But the result is, well, we still built another god, the golden calf. And then once you start putting it all into place, you get the awakening from below where Moses and the people, and Moses is giving the instructions, and Moses blesses the, the end product. And now you get the presence of God dwelling powerfully in that tabernacle. That right there is the awakening from above, awakening from below. Now, we're, we'll cover this again next week, and we'll look even deeper into these last 15 chapters at some of the things that are going on, because I think they help us highlight this. But uh, it's something to consider. This is our Christian walk. Now, it's put in the context of, of Judaism, because we're back in the Old Testament, but this is our Christian walk. It's the same process. God didn't change. We transform through the building of the kingdom of, of heaven or the kingdom of God. It's through tithing. It's through serving. When you serve someone who can never pay you back, particularly if, if you know that they're on a lower socioeconomic status than you, when you go into servant mode, what you're doing is you're lowering your, uh, you're lowering your perspective below theirs, which allows you to see more of their humanity. You're not looking down on them. You're not judging them. You begin to see them and their humanity as they are. And when we can see the humanity of everybody else, we begin to become more compassionate. We, we less judgmental. So go serve someone who can never pay you back just for the sake of serving, and you'll begin to see more of their humanity. Get to know them. Learn their story. And by doing that, it changes the way you view humanity, and it'll change you. That's what's happening, because your view is changing. So, awakening from above and below, it's a really powerful concept. We'll talk more about it over the next couple weeks. 